unto the host of the Syrians. If they save us alive, we shall live. If they kill us, we shall but die. And they arose up in the twilight to go into the camp of the Syrians. And when they were come into the uttermost part of the camp of Syria, behold, there was no man there. For the Lord had made the host of the Syrians to hear the noise of chariots and the noise of horses and the noise of a great host. And they said one to another, Lo, the king of Israel hath hired against us kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians to come upon us. Wherefore they arose and fled in the twilight and left their tents and their horses and their asses even unto the camp as it was and fled for their life. Verse 8. And when these lepers came to the othermost part of the camp and went into one tent, they did eat and drink and carried thence silver and gold and raiment and went and hid it and came again and entered into another tent and carried thence also and went in and hid it. Then they said one to another, we do not well. This day is a day of good tidings and we hold our peace. If we tarry till the morning light, some mischief will come upon us. Now therefore come, that we may go and tell the king's household. So they came and called unto the porter of the city, and they told them, saying, We came into the camp of the Syrians, and behold, there was no man there, neither voice of man, but horses tied, asses tied, and tents as they were. Father, we thank you for the word of God. I pray that you'd help my hands and my voice tonight, that we'd be clear. Lord, see some examples in some leprous that saved an entire kingdom. Lord, I pray that we'd see some truths and make application to ourselves tonight. Help us, Lord, to be closer with you. We ask it in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Appreciate you standing. You can be seated. I'm going to kind of catch you up here on what has happened. And so you have the nation, really, of Israel, the king that's there. And they're in that city. And the enemy shows up. And they are the Syrian army. And they show up. And basically, they surround the city to prevent any food from going in and not permitting them to come out of the city. So what's happened is they've cut off. They've cut off all of the supply lines. And they've left them inside that city. And they're not able to go out or to come in. They've been stuck there. And what happens is that food begins to run out. So they start to eat some weird things, right? They're eating horses' heads. They're eating dung. The last thing that we see, sadly, is that they actually eat a baby. And so you can see that they are starving, and it is a serious situation that they're stuck in. They are soon nigh unto death, really. Now the king sees that boy and it pricks his heart. Matter of fact, he gets upset against the prophet Elijah and wants to have him killed. But the king sees that and he's stuck in this situation. They're in the city and all around them is a prevention that there's no food to get in there. Soon they're going to starve to death or they'll surrender and be able to come out and submit to the authority of the enemy. When I was looking at that and just trying to, you know, catch up in your study, not a quite same comparison, but boy, we live in a day that is full of sinfulness, don't we? We do. And sometimes we as, I'm going to say spiritual people, born again people, well, we can look out and see a starvation or a prevention of spiritual things. Uh, I don't know, I, I remember growing up in the 80s that uh, there was a lot of, I'll say biblical events really. There was, I'm not saying they were always church, but it was uh, more polite and, and more right and I could hear biblical things. We even prayed and, and still did the pledge in our school during that time. So there were some things that I remember seeing and hearing in, in my lifetime of growing up that was still there. But boy, today you even mentioned the Bible and uh, you know, the, the people get very upset or you begin to talk about spiritual things and many people today are very absent of anything that's spiritual and absent of anything that's biblical. 
right? If they know anything about the Bible, it's things that they've heard or seen on TV or heard spoken from other people that doesn't even match Scripture. And what I'm saying is there's a starvation of spiritual things. Churches are closing their door. People are not going out, spreading the gospel. It just seems to dwindle down. And I can look at that and picture in my mind, it's almost the same as Christians. And all around us is the evil world and the devil that's trying to prevent everything from coming into our life that's spiritual. And we become starved also. So sometimes the world might feel the same with spiritual things. People become starved of the spiritual food because they are given to sinful influences. Can I say they're blocking off God's way of speaking to them. They're quenching the Holy Spirit. They're closing their Bibles. They're lacking prayer. And they're not permitting really to feed the spiritual things that we need with our life so that the Holy Spirit of God will lead us. And people begin to cut off different things that God has given them to be spiritually fed. You say, like what? Well, three things that pop into my mind, right? We have access to the throne room of grace by prayer. And many times we lack prayer. We have the answers from God and the way of life in His Word, the Bible, and many people close the Bible and don't read that. God has established a church, a place for us to be fed, right, with the uh, truth and, and, and the Spirit of God is in the presence of the church and people... Uh, will avoid that or be against the church. So there's, there's things in this world that God has given to us that we cut off and we become starved. And we will begin to do what? Things that are wrong. They were eating things they never would have ate before. Why is that? They're starving. They're just trying to survive. And when we as Christians back away from the things that God has given us, We'll do the same thing. Things that we knew were wrong, eh, they'll be all right. It's just a little bit. It's okay. Why is that happening? Because we have a spiritual, we're preventing God to work in our lives. And we'll end up at the place when we're left to ourselves that we will do that which is right in our own eyes. We'll avoid the, the leading the guidance of the Bible, the boundaries of the Bible. And we'll begin to do wrong. These four left dying at the gate. They, could, they would either die of starvation, they would die from their disease, or if they went to the enemy, they would die. I want you to understand, their future was not good. <laughs> they weren't allowed to go into the city anyway because of the disease. Right? They've been forbidden. Forbidden. They had to stay outside because of the leprosy that would influence or spread to other people. So therefore, they had to stay there. Many times, if you look way back in biblical times, they had their own, I'll say, camp of leprosy people. They weren't permitted to go into a, another place because that disease would spread. So they were isolated people already, really left to die. There was nothing that they could do for them. There was no medicine at that time. The only way that anything could happen is if they would go to the priest and God see fit to uh, take away that leprosy, that's the only way that they would survive. They would just stay there. So they were already isolated. you got to understand they're, they're in their quote-unquote isolation camp, four of them, and they're sitting there. And they have this discussion. In my mind, it goes this way. What's the point of going into the city anyway? Number one, we're not allowed, but if we go in there, we're going to starve. There's nothing there. There's no food there. So if we go in there, we're going to die. If we stay right here, we're going to starve to death before this leprosy even kills us. So they come up with this crazy idea. Well, we'll just go down there to the enemy. They have food. They have drink. They have everything that's needed. And if we stay here, we're going to die. So what's the difference? If we go down there and they kill us, at least it'll be quick. It'll be done. We don't have to starve. That's the way of dying. So they say, they come up with this idea in verse 3. Verse 3. Four leprous men, at the entering of the gate, they said one to another, Why sit we here until we die? Well, that's a famous quote, really, if you think about that in life. There's a lot of application. But why sit we here until we die? They had no place to go. And they figure, what do we have to lose? I wish 
way, truthfully. I wish we at church saw that way. Why sit we here and die? What's, what's the goal of coming together and never spreading the gospel? What's the goal of coming together and hearing the word of God and never applying it? What's the goal of seeing the benefits, if you will, the, the promises and the blessings that God gives to us through prayer and, and seeking His face and doing the things that God has given to us? What's the point of that if we just sit here and die? Right? Listen, we're all going to die one day. There's only one way that we're not dying, and that's if the trumpet sounds. That's it. If Jesus Christ comes back, you won't die. But if He does not, guess what? We're all going to die. Everybody in this room. Now the blessing we have as saved individuals, we don't really die. This body just stays here and the Spirit goes back to God. Boom, and we're in heaven forever. Praise the Lord for that. But we in this earthly body are going to die. So can I ask you, why sit we here and die? So we might look at this and say, boy, that was a crazy idea, but boy, there's a lot of things that are application for us. So once you see that the recognition of their position, the recognition of their position, in verse 3, they say, if we stay here, we're going to die, but look at verse 4. Verse 4 says, if we say we went into the city, then the famine of the city, we shall die there. If we sit here, we die also. Now therefore come and let us go fall into the host of the Syrians. And if they save us alive, we shall live. But if they kill us, we shall die. So they recognized their position, right? They, they knew that they were going to die, number one. Number two, they had some options. And they decided in the city wasn't a good one. Staying here wasn't a good one. So let's go down there and see what happens with the enemy. But one thing's they have food. They have drink. They have what we need for life. They decided, after they recognized they're going to die, let's just go ahead and go on down there and see what happens. Now I'm not going to say it because of the area that we live in, but I'm just you're probably not going to die if you go into a lost world and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Probably not going to happen. It's not. You're going to die, right? So why are you not warning them? Why are you not proclaiming to them? Why are we not serving the Lord now? Why are we just sitting here till we die in a spiritual sense? You're going to die no matter what happens. Why waste your life sitting and doing nothing? They recognize their position. And it's good for us to do something as well for our spiritual life and for God. We need to get busy for the Lord. There's nobody that's going to live forever sitting here right now. I wish that was true. You will in heaven, but not here on this earth. And every day that you waste is every day that you have a lost opportunity of recognizing your position of going into a lost and dying world and giving them a way of life. They recognized their position, and it wasn't a good one. The second thing that they recognized, I'm sorry, uh, the second thing that they do is respond to their position. So they still could have discussed it, still could have thought up a good idea, still could have said, yep, yeah, we should do this thing, and stayed. Don't, don't we do that? Surely we do. I'm sure when we think we should be reading the Word of God, it's a good thing to do, but sometimes we don't do that. Maybe we think, oh, now's a good time to pray, but we don't do that. <laughs> Uh, now's a good time to go to church and we don't do that. Now's a good time to witness and we don't do that. Now's a good time to give that track and we don't do that. Now's a good time to call that brother or sister in Christ and encourage him, but we don't do that, right? So it's the same thing. Just because it's a good idea and we recognize that, yeah, we're going to die and for the Lord doesn't mean that we're going to do it, right? Y'all looking at me like I'm crazy. The church is not packed out, Right? Church is not full. We still have tracks on the table back here. We still have about 3,000 John and Romans right over there, right? 
Uh, we still have plenty of vacancies in the van on visitation days, and you still have neighbors that are lost, and you still have co-workers that are lost, and you still have friends that are lost. I'm just saying, just because it's a, a good idea doesn't mean that we're involved in that. So even when we recognize that, yes, we're going to die, and yes, we need to be doing something, we have to respond to that. Can I say it another way? Uh, when we're reading the Word of God or the preaching of the Word of God and we feel conviction, we have to respond. You know I mean? The conviction's there. It's a good thing. That means the Holy Spirit of God's doing something in your life, but you have to respond to that. So they recognize their position, but they also respond to their position. And you know what's amazing? Is God already had everything set up. Verse 5. And they rose up in the twilight to go into the camp of the Syrians. And when they were coming to the uttermost part of the camp of Syria, behold, there was no man. See, you understand what happened? They're, they're sitting at the gate. Man, we're going to die if we stay here. I know that. Hey, you want to go into the city? No, they ain't got no food. McDonald's is closed. It's shut down. All right. Well, do you think that maybe we should go over there? Well, I don't know. Hey. You know who has a buffet? The Syrian army. <laughs> and it's a short walk right over there. They probably have Taco Bell because McDonald's is shut down, right? Now they've got the meat. They've got the vegetables. They've got the fruit. They have everything that we need right there. And if we sit here and we stay here, we're going to die. You're right. We're going to die. You're right. We're going to die. So let's just go ahead and see what they're going to do. And they make a decision to get up and go. And God's already got the thing prepared. Can you imagine in their minds what happened? They know the army is there. They've seen the prevention of the supply lines and the food of going in. And they know that they've cut it off. And they go walking down the hill. And they go into the camp and there's nothing there. There's just tents and tents and tents and tents and tents and some horses and some, some donkeys. There's nothing there. It says not even a man's voice. I wonder if they were fighting on which tent they were going to go in. This one's mine. That one's mine. I just, I wonder. Why, but, but it says that they went in. And there's no, nothing there. They're all gone. You know, many times we have anxiety about things, right? It doesn't even happen. We think if we go and talk to that person, something bad's going to happen. We think if we respond to the preaching of the Word of God, God's going to call me to Africa. We think that if, if we uh, get, uh, go talk to that individual, they're going to, they're going to mock me or if I read the Word of God, they're going to hold me accountable for something, accountable for that thing. We have anxiety, anxieties in our mind that don't even happen a majority of the time. You know what it really is? We lack trust in the Lord. Everything you read in the scripture, God knows and will, he promises, to take care of us. They go into the camp and God's already got the thing prepared. It's amazing. They rise, go, don't want to starve, and they shut up and there's nobody there. You know, let me say this. You drown in the sinful world. But that will, that, in a sinful world that will not stop sinning, or you can make a difference, you're going to die one way or another. Let me say that again. You will die no matter what. And you can make a difference in this sinful world, or you can permit that sinful world to overwhelm and drown you. You make a difference. They could have stayed and died. They decided we're not going to die. You can make a difference in the world. So they respond in a manner that trusts the Lord. These four men that really are left and destined to die. And really it's the same as us before our salvation happened, right? We were destined to die. We were destined to go to a devil's hell if we decide to reject Jesus Christ. We were dead people walking. And then it happened somehow. The Lord Jesus Christ was preached to you or you read it or a tract was given to you and you understood your situation and you had to respond to that. You had to say, yep, without Jesus Christ, I'm going to die. 
Without Jesus Christ, I'll go to a devil's hell. Without Jesus Christ, my life is not going to be worth nothing. And you had to respond to that. You said, well, it doesn't matter. We're all going to die anyway. We'll see what happens in the end. But you decided to say, no, no, no. I'm trusting what I'm reading. I'm trusting what's been preached to me. I'm trusting that God wants me to be saved. And I'm trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. And you made a decision step by faith to be saved. Now, you're still destined to die in this earthly body, right? But you can still make a big difference in this world. If God can use four lepers who can't even have the permission to go into a city, talk to people, to save an entire kingdom, can I say this? God can surely use you. Surely he can use you. A God that provides mercy and grace through Jesus Christ. A God that wants to use us. They recognize their position. We're all going to die. They respond to that position and saying, instead of just sitting here and die, we're going to go and do something. And I want you to look at the reality, the reality of their position. Verses 6 through he says, For the Lord had made the host of the Syrians to hear a noise, chariots, horses, a great host. They said one to another, Hey, the king has hired some people to defeat us. Verse 7, Wherefore they arose and fled in the twilight and left their tents, their horses, their asses, and even the camp as it was, and they fled for their life. And when these lepers came into the uttermost part of the camp and went into one tent and did eat and drink and carried thence the silver and the gold and the rain and went and hid it, and came again and entered into another tent, and carried them also, and went and hid it. The reality of their situation was, they were completely rich, and they had the best buffet possible. Everything they needed was there. Just think for a minute. If they would have decided to stay at the gate, I'm just going to use a half a mile. If they would have stayed there, they would have died. And everything they needed was a half a mile down there. And God said, here's food you need for life. Here's the riches, the finances you need. Here's the tent for the covering. And here's the new clothes you need. God says, here's everything. Thank you for responding appropriately. God says, thank you for receiving my blessings. God says, thank you that you understood that there was something that needed to be done and you decided to go ahead and do it. Thank you for letting me bless and use you. The reality of the situation was everything was there. For them. And they went. And they find everything that's needed for life. They would have never have known what God had done if they stayed there at the gate to die. They would have starved. Yet there was a buffet a short way down. And when they get there, God has departed the entire army. There is no more enemy there. They're gone. And it's full of spoil. Everything that they need for life. Life for them. And the entire kingdom. Jesus Christ is life for all. Right? Jesus Christ is my life. And Jesus Christ is life for the kingdom. Can I say Greece or wherever you live. Jesus Christ is enough for them and needed for them. And Jesus Christ is enough for you and needed for you. We have the Savior. We have salvation. We have everything that we need. Miss out on God, um, we miss out on what God has done for us. And you know, the reality of it is, God says everything here can be given to you. Look with me in Psalm chapter 2. Keep your, keep your place. Look in Psalm chapter 2. Psalm chapter 2. Look at verse 8. Verse 8. He says, Ask of me. And I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. There's a friend of mine, he's a missionary, and I can't say where he's at, but he's in a, a country that's closed. He's in a place that uh, is not permitted to openly preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's his verse. There aren't many missionaries going to that place. Truthfully, there's not many people that we hear about being saved from that place. It's a very dangerous place. 
But this is the verse he uses. He says, my God says, the heathen are mine. The land is mine. And he can stay in America and say it's dangerous. He can stay in America and say it's closed. He can stay in America and say that I'm not going to go there. It's not going to matter. Or he can say, you know what, I'm going to die either way, so I'm going to go. You know what he's doing? He's trusting the Lord. The reality of it is everything belongs to God anyway, right? God's all-powerful. God has all control. If we will ask, he'll give it to us. If they stayed, they'd have missed out. If they would have stayed, they would not have seen the blessings of God. If they would have stayed, they would have died. But they decided to follow the Lord and respond and go. And they find everything that's needed for life. God has overcome, defeated the enemy, as he does all the time. He just wants us to go, do, trust, and believe. He's going to do all the work for us. He just wants us to trust him enough to go. Lastly, there is a reaction Verse 9, go back with me to 2 Kings, 2 Kings, 2 Kings chapter 6. There's a reaction to what happened as they seen the blessings of God. Let me back up just for a minute. They could have stayed there and the nation of Israel would have never known. They were not going out of the city, understand that. So the lepers could have stayed there, I don't know, a week, two weeks, a month, maybe a year. They would have never have known because they were in hiding. They weren't going to go out and check and see what's up. Matter of fact, when they went back and told them, hey, there's no man here, the king said, hey, send a secret party first because maybe they're hiding on the outside. And when we show up, they're going to come in and kill us. They said, maybe they're hiding in secret. So he didn't even trust that. They could have stayed there the whole time. They could have continued to hide those things and tell them, hey, we found one piece of silver and we got one piece of bread here, right? Because they were hiding the things. But look at their reaction when they see God's blessing upon their life. Let me just say, it should influence us when we think about the salvation that God's given us. Verse 9, he says, And they said one to another, We do not well. This day is a, good, is a day of good tidings. And if we hold our peace, if we tarry till morning light, some mischief, will come upon us. Now therefore come, that we may go and tell the king's household. I can't help but think about salvation. This good thing that God has given to me. I could die tomorrow and not have the opportunity to tell my friend. I could die tomorrow and not have the opportunity to tell my neighbor. I know God owns everything. And I could tell a friend to receive the encouragement that's needed. I could tell my neighbor that they can get the help that they need. I can go to a friend or a, a co-worker or go to a, a brother or sister in Christ and just say, hey, get back to the Lord. He knows everything. He has everything. What about the good tidings that He has given to us? Boy, if we'd have had the same mindset as them. We can't wait till tomorrow or some mischief might happen. I'm not saying it's a punishment or God's waiting to, to kill you, but I'm just saying if we understood how much God has given to us, wouldn't it be a wonderful thing if we said, we can't wait till tomorrow to tell you about the gospel. We can't wait till tomorrow to tell you what God's done in our life. I can't wait to tell you tomorrow the things that are in the Word of God that He's shown me. You understand what I'm saying? The excitement that they had when they realized what God had done for them. And they said, we got to go and share. We have to go and tell. Now, remember the group we're talking about. The four lepers were really left to die. <laughs> they were kicked out of the city. These are people that the city doesn't like and made them get out of the city. And yet they've received the blessings of God. They say, we got to go back and tell them. We have to we got to tell them. If the gospel's hid, it's hid to those that are lost. we got to tell them. The reaction is, they got the food, they got the drink, they got the silver, they got the gold, they got the raiment, they got the freedom. And when they realized that, the light bulb went off. And they said, we must share it. We must go and tell the king's household. Really, we have to go and tell that the kingdom is can be saved. They could have stayed. They could have hit it. But they did not. They went to hell. Go with me to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. 
Matthew chapter 6. Look with me really quick. Verses 25 through 28. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body what you shall put on. Is not life more than meat and the body more than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather in barns. Your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto your stature? What are you saying here? God feeds the birds. God provides the sun for the plants. And God provides the water that's needed for plants. These things that have not a spirit, they don't have a soul. And God provides for them and feeds for them. And he says, how much more you? How much more you? God will provide everything that you need for this life. You gotta trust him. And he says, You're taking out of these things and you've forgotten what God has provided for you. Look at 31 through 34. Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or withal shall we be clothed? For after all of these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all of these things. God knows you need clothes. God knows you need food. God knows you need drink, water. God knows everything you need. In this life. Verse 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness. And all of these things shall be added unto thee. What's he saying? Don't focus on the worldly things. Don't stay and sit here till you die. Trust God and go. God will provide for you everything you need for this life and more beyond what we think or imagine. Verse 34 says, Take therefore no thought for tomorrow, for the tomorrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Don't focus on the worldly things. Focus on the spiritual things. Can I say this? We're robbing these people that are lost. The blessings of God and everlasting life when we decide to say, I'm going to stay here and sit here till I die. God's given us everlasting life. God's given us abundant life. God's given us riches untold. He's the greatest physician, the greatest healer, the greatest counselor in the world. And why do we keep it to ourselves when we should be sharing it with them? God used four lepers. Really, it's a picture of sinful men. They were outcasts, isolated, left to die. And they decided, we need to do something for the kingdom. And because they moved, the kingdom was saved. Listen, the king could have sent soldiers. The king could have sent dignitaries. The king could have sent whoever he wanted. He decided he wasn't going to do that. And God used four Dying individuals to save an entire kingdom. He used lepers, pictures of sinful men, to save a kingdom. How much more, let me just ask you, how much more could God do with us, sinners saved by grace, to reach the kingdom in our area? If he can use those four lepers to save that that kingdom, he can use us. Sinners saved by grace under the authority and power of God who gives us everything that we need to not stay here and sit till we die. We must go and tell the kingdom the things of God. Are you willing to use those four? Well, you can mark it down and be for sure God's willing to use you. You just got to understand you have to get up and go. We're all going to die. Every one of us. And when we die, all of these things stay. Why not get up, arise, and go, and share, and tell of God. Don't miss out on the blessings of God because you're comfortable and decide you're going to sit and stay till you die. Get up, go, and tell. 
and see the power and hand of God. It's an amazing thing. It's already prepared. It's there for our taking. But the decision's ours. The decision's ours. Father, thank you, Lord, for this recorded piece of history that we have, that we see that you're willing to use anyone, truthfully, that will humble themselves and look to you. God, we've seen that again and again and again, all the different messages on Sunday night, Lord, how you use ordinary people in an uncommon way, Lord, to do your work. And all of them have some similar characteristics and that they're willing, they'll humble themselves, and they recognize who they are compared to you. And Father, all of them decide to do what? Trust you. And because of that, you use them in a mighty way. And you told us in the New Testament that the Old Testament is there for our examples. To help us to see principles and to understand how you work and who you are, God. And you're all powerful. You own everything. And you say you've never even seen the righteous begging bread. It says that in Psalms, Lord. So we know that if we'll trust you completely, God, help us to do that. We are starving in a sinful world. I understand that, Lord. But God, help us to not starve ourselves. We have the spiritual things that we need to feed our inner man. That's the word of God and prayer and the church that you've given to us, brothers and sisters in Christ, to encourage. Lord, there's so much spiritual food out there, Lord. I pray that we wouldn't permit the world to cut all of that off, that we would starve. But recognize it's all there for the taking. And Lord, truthfully, as we take those spiritual things, we in turn more glorify you. Bless us, God. Help us to get up and go. Father, you have given us salvation, everlasting life for every individual here that has heard that Jesus Christ died for them, has understood that they need to repent of their sin and trust in you by faith by confessing, crying out, saying, yes, I'm a sinner. And at the same time, believing in their heart that you saved, that you, that you forgive, that you are a personal Savior. To every individual that's been saved, there's so much more out there in the world. There's the buffet. There's all the gold, all the silver, all the raiment that's needed is out there, God. We just have to trust you to get up, go, and tell. Father, I pray whatever is preventing us from doing that tonight, Lord, we'd be willing to say I'm done with it. Lord, I need help in my life. Maybe it's financial. Maybe it's health. Maybe it's relationship. Maybe it's a fear of proclaiming the gospel. Maybe it's a lack of understanding. Maybe we're lacking wisdom. All of those things you say in the scripture, if we'll search and ask, you'll give them to us. Lord, you'll give us what we need. And now I ask you, Lord, that you work on the hearts of every individual here and say, I'm willing to do that. I'm not going to sit here till I die. I'm not just going to wait on that trumpet. I'm not just going to wait till my life comes to an end. I'm going to get up. I'm going to go. I'm going to see. I'm going to receive. I'm going to be involved in those blessings. You know what I'm going to do with all of these? I'm going to share them with other people. Lord, help us to, quote, unquote, save a kingdom. Our neighbors, our family, our friends. I'm not saying, Lord, you know my heart that we save, but we have the message that we can give to them to see them save. Lord, help us to trust you more, please. And whatever's preventing that tonight, Lord, help us to get it out of our life. Bless the invitation. It's our time to talk with you, Lord. Help us to not put it off and to prevent the conviction, but to, to submit to that and be used by you, Lord. Please, bless the invitation now we ask. It's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. The invitation's open. If you need to talk with the Lord, you go ahead and do that. Will you be like those four lepers? That's the question.